once again, Dave Abair has given me the, that last little connecting thing that makes my talk make sense to me. You see, young kids have that wonderfully open mind that will accept dang near anything. You know, we tell them all sorts of stuff like that butter comes from cows and they're just like, oh, okay. And they believe us. And sometimes kids, uh, many of you have heard me tell the story about thinking that when my mom turned on the self-cleaning oven, we left the house so that the oven could have privacy to take its bath. I honestly believe that it slid out and little arms came out and it would take its little bath. It's part of why it was in the kitchen. And then it would slide back in when it was done and then we'd come home. Now, knowing the, the truth, means that when I turn on <clears throat> my self-cleaning oven, I don't have to leave the house. Knowing the truth means that I can still take that childlike acceptance and open it up to a bigger truth, a capital T truth. What in Zen is called beginner's mind. It is willing to accept new information. <clears throat> and God knows we have been we have had not good information shared with us lately, haven't we? There's a whole thing going on about fake news and, and where do we get the information that's reliable? As religious scientists, what we know is that the most reliable information will come from within ourselves, come from the divine being, <coughs> excuse me, that lives and moves and has its being through us. We are surrounded by a living divine being. We are surrounded by the energy of life itself. And that life is experiencing the world through us. If we will listen to that, what we find is a lot of these things that we got taught, either in school or outside of school by life, all of those things start getting a little less crusted on is how I think about it. So, for instance, in school, I learned all about how the conquistadors under Cortes came to South America and uh, pacified the savages. I'm putting that in quotes because obviously that's not the truth about the Incan Empire. I was taught that Cortes basically just kind of walked across the land, got welcomed by the emperor Montezuma. And he just turned everything over to Cortez because, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe he thought he had found that his betters. I'm here to tell you that's not the truth. What Cortez didn't know was that Montezuma was in a great big war with some of his neighbors. And so when he came and he met the, the Incan emissaries, they led him back to Montezuma, but through enemy territory so that these people would be exhausted. The Spaniards were exhausted by the time they got to Tenochtitlan. Not only that, but <clears throat> the, a lot of the things that Cortez claimed as his great victories were actually battles he wasn't even involved in. He was not part of it. He was just claiming it, figuring, no one's gonna catch me. They're all the way back in the old world. He finally gets to uh, Tenochtitlan and what gets put in the history books is that there's all sorts of human sacrifice going on. No, there were some human sacrifices, I'm sure, and the number that was sent back to make the people there look like savages, even mathematically, it does not work. He is brought before Montezuma. And what they had was a conversation that very closely resembled Abbott and Costello's old bit about um, who's on first. Montezuma was extremely well trained in the rhetoric of his nation, in which you kind of downplay everything you are, as if you were saying, um, you know, you're all decked out in your formal regalia, and somebody comments on it, and you say, oh, this old thing. Cortez did not realize that he was as much as being laughed at within the court. And when he took all of that rhetoric seriously and sent that back to Spain, to the people who were, who were um, 
awaiting his his reports, it made him look really good because they didn't understand how Montezuma worked either. Now Cortez, as I was taught, was this great big hero. But if you follow his life along and what he did when he got to California, what became California, he was pretty incompetent. And all of the good stuff that got done was done by his underlings. They made him, their boss look really good. So this is the story with a little bit more truth added. And yet what's in our textbooks is absolutely not that. It is absolutely not that. It is, it is kind of half the story at best. This, what happens in history, happens to all of us on a personal level as well. There is simply a truth that when we interact with people, we're not always having the same conversation. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that sometimes you have a conversation with people and each of you walk away and the other person starts doing some weird stuff because, and it's not what you agreed to, and you have to come back and have the conversation again and gain greater clarity. Uh, Byron Katie, who is the author of the work, talks about not really knowing uh, or, or challenging your own belief in what is true. This is a huge chunk of what we do in religious science. We have to start by challenging our belief systems. So she tells a story about going into a bathroom, uh, not to be too indelicate, she gets into the stall and realizes that the seat is soaking wet. And she starts having a conversation in her head with the previous person about how they are obviously slobs and they're so inconsiderate and they're so wrong and evil and bad and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden this person who has no idea what's going on becomes almost the devil incarnate in uh, Byron Katie's mind. I might have stressed that a bit too much. So she cleans up the seat, she does her stuff, she flushes the toilet, and as she does that, water spews everywhere. The spigot from the toilet is badly aimed. There is no way to get out of a wet seat in that case. And so she just kind of has to laugh at herself and say, see, I made up a whole great big story about everything the previous occupant was and none of it was true. When I was in high school, an entire relationship died on our definition of the word it. I thought he meant it as one thing, and he was asking it as another thing. It took me years to figure out what the heck had happened and why I had lost a friend that day, why our relationship went so sour. We often move around in this world as if we know what we're doing. And it works to a large degree. Often there are shared assumptions that are actually accurate. However, got to ask, if this is true of us on a personal level and true of humanity on the historical level, it makes perfect sense to me that it happens on the cosmic level as well. As above, so below, as within, so without. Ernest Holmes talks about the, us as a microcosm of the macrocosm. So everything we do in miniature is going on at the universal level, just at an exponentially larger but equal rate of being. So what if the truth that will set us free is a cosmic truth? It happens at the human level. You get better information. You know what you're doing. You are more able to act effectively in your world. What if knowing the capital T truth will set us free means that that thing we call the original sin, the belief in separation between each of us and us and the divine being. What if that is the sin we need to be forgiven for.
Now, when I talk about the forgiveness of sins, it doesn't sound very science of mind, does it? It's not what you're used to hearing from me. However, I've been reading Emma Curtis Hopkins all week, and she works within a Christian uh, mindset, within a Christian metaphor, shall we say. I was reminded by one of our practitioners about the saying that he has up in his office about the truth will set you free, but first it will you off. Um, it will make you really uncomfortable. If you look at the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, the one who seeks should not cease seeking until he finds. And when he finds, he will be dismayed. And when he's dismayed, he will be astonished, and then he will be the king over all. Or, excuse me, he will be king over the all. So first we find the truth, and it totally messes with our heads. And then we have that moment of awe, really? Oh my gosh, this is real. And that's when we really have authority over people, places, and things, over our own internal experience, over um, we can cure illness without really working too hard because we know the truth. Because we are able to see through what is at the, at the level of effect, at the level of the physical world. We're able to see through it to the truth. Now, I said we need to be forgiven for the sin of belief and separation. When I say forgiven, I'm not talking about being humiliated and then working your way back by saying five Hail Marys and ten Our Fathers or getting hit or any of that stuff. If you look at Emma Curtis Hopkins' work, she will talk about how forgiving is to give for. If I am willing to take all of my sadness and lack of understanding and all the ways I've been hurt and give them to the divine side of my being, what will be given for that is grace. I, it's, it's a trade. And it's a very generous trade on the part of our divine selves. It is a way of saying, I am heartbroken over these beliefs I am holding I am so sick of trying to get out of them. I feel like I'm at the, my walls are so thick and deep. I feel like I'm at the bottom of a well now. And there's no way to climb out of it. So let me take all of these beliefs that made up the stone of my prison and hand them over, put them on the altar of love. And what gets back to me, what's given for me, is grace, is freedom, is access to the most intense love and joy and power and peace that I could have dreamed of and then somewhere beyond that. This is the truth that sets us free, that we are forgiven for our sins means we let go of the old belief and the divine gives us grace so that all of a sudden any belief in illness goes away. What is ours to do is keep our eyes focused on the truth that is beyond the actual physical world. Now, this confuses some people. And this is where we sometimes get in trouble because what I'm saying is look beyond the bad. That doesn't mean that we never bother to see the bad. If you don't notice something's wrong, you're never ever going to think to fix it, right? If you can't possibly see that your neighbor is hurting, you will never do anything, including going to prayer, in order to, in order to be with your neighbor compassionately and allow that to be healed. So in the Living the Science of Mind, Ernest Holmes specifically uh, addresses that need to ignore the bad, which we said, I mean, it's easier. We could just pray it all away. It's all spiritual and it's all good. <laughs> That's not how we work. On page 252 of Living the Science of Mind, it says, in the science of mind, which is one of the names of our philosophy, in the science of mind, we do not say everything is all right when it is all wrong. We do not say peace where there is no peace, but rather we try to discover what is wrong and why we do not have peace. 
We do not say that people are not poor, sick, or unhappy. We ask why these things should be if the original cause of all things is harmonious, perfect, radiant, and happy. So if your neighbor is struggling with something, and by neighbor I mean anyone else who exists within the Christ mind, oh my gosh, that's all of us. If our brothers and sisters within the Christ consciousness are suffering, we don't turn our face from them. We absolutely choose to join them there in order to allow that other aspect of the one mind to be raised out of whatever is causing them pain. This has become a real issue within our movement right now. Because people started figuring out that we were kind of navel-gazing for a while there. We got so up in our heads and philosophical that we forgot to go out into the world and use this stuff. And so there is an awakening that happened that said, why aren't we seeing the great miracles we used to see when Ernest Holmes was alive? Why has the age of miracles passed? Or has it? I will tell you that Ernest Holmes, there's so many stories about him kind of just sitting out in front of the, the Institute and watching people as they walk past in L.A. And every so often, he would get one of them to come and sit down with him and talk to him. There's a story about one particular gentleman who was so drunk, he didn't much have a choice about sitting down. It was sit or fall. And so Dr. Holmes brought him in, cleaned him up. And within a few weeks, he was on the ministerial path and sober. But he did this so often, he would bring in prostitutes to come hear him speak. He was just like Jesus in that he brought in the people everybody in their furs and their pearls were going to ignore. There was even, um, there was some conversation about whether he should be doing that. And he got a little bit of a reputation amongst the gossips for always bringing in these sketchy characters. But some of those sketchy characters heard what was being said and they turned their lives around. They turned their own lives around. Having heard the truth, it set them free. Now in the mainstream Christianity, they would say that they had been forgiven for their sins. And we all know what that means now, right? So, for each and every one of us, we can look out into this world and find plenty of issues to work on. What I want you to remember is that not every single issue will be yours to address. Not every single way of addressing an issue will be yours to do. I am still learning a lot about uh, white fragility, about how the race relationship works and what it is that I am completely unaware of as a white person because I was raised thinking this is just the only way to live. Of course, when I was a kid, I thought everybody was military and Catholic, and apparently that's not so true. I didn't, I was in college before, before I found out what homosexuality was, and that was only because all the guys were wearing more makeup than the girls, and the girls had hairier legs. I couldn't figure out what was going on, why some people were so excited that it was an all-girls dorm and they got to sleep, to share a room with, turns out, their partner. I didn't know what any of it meant. And so I had to stumble along and learn a greater truth. I'd suggest to you that that is what this nation, this, this country is doing right now. We might be stumbling a little bit. It might not be pretty. But we are learning a greater truth and the freedom that will come of that. The freedom that comes of being open to a new way of being is astounding. Now, we are not the first Americans to work on this. This past week, uh, John Lewis, who was one of the great heroes of the civil rights movement, passed away and passed into a greater understanding of just how free and beautiful his soul is. Several of the people who marched with Dr. King have passed away recently, and I apologize for not knowing all their names. Some of the original freedom writers. 
but they have left behind them a legacy. And that would be us. That would be us as we look around this world to find what it is that is ours to do. If dealing with racial issues is, is not what feels like yours to do or it doesn't feel like you have found the right way to do it, that's fine. We all get to try different things. This week, I dropped out of the book study for the book White, uh, White Supremacy and Me. It just, it wasn't working for me. And so I went to some of the other books, got the same information in a different way, continued my work in a different way. If it's the issue of homelessness and, and you're looking to deal with uh, disparity in income and dispar therefore disparity in opportunity, the Center for uh, the Coalition for Compassion and Justice is right in Prescott uh, downtown. And they do a housing first program where they get people underneath a roof where they can rest. One of the biggest problems with being homeless is that you cannot get sufficient sleep. And so you're walking around sleep deprived. Anyone with a kid knows that that is not you at your best. Anyone who's had a baby still figuring out how to sleep through the night knows that being sleep deprived takes away many, many, many IQ points. And we don't look down on new moms and dads for being uh, tired. We raise them up. We bring them food. We, everybody tries to steal the baby, but that's okay because, you know, keep them in the house. <sighs> they do the homing first, and then they work on things like how to be employable, how to be a good renter. They get them into homes, and then they teach them what it's like to pay rent what it's like to earn your own money so you can pay rent. And this is beautiful work. This is meeting them at the level where they are and showing them a different truth, the truth of their absolute worthiness in spirit, their absolute worthiness to have a home and a job and self-esteem and the ability to just get up in the middle of the night and make yourself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because it's your flipping kitchen. These things are what is ours to do, ours to share with the world. Now, I will remind you that we do not do this because we're rescuing anyone. An adult child of God does not need to be saved by us because we've discovered the truth. They too are divine. As a matter of fact, Ernest Holmes said, there is no place in this practice for arrogance or the holier-than-thou attitude. The great have always been humble. The great have always been kind. The great have always been lovers of humanity. And so as we learn the truth that it sets us free, it sets us free to go out there and see our brothers and sisters in the Christ consciousness as they truly are. One of the ways that we choose to, to get into that awareness, to bring ourselves back, to the Christ consciousness is through prayer. And so I'll take us to prayer right now, knowing, knowing that there is a capital T truth that is just waiting to be acknowledged and witnessed. That capital T truth is absolute oneness, that God is all there is, God is all there ever could be, and that thing we're calling God is the energy of life itself. It is here and now in this very moment living in, through, as, and for each and every one of us. It is in the person you see sitting by the side of the road who has forgotten who they are. It is in the powerful people who run this planet. It is in each and every one of your neighbors on the left and the right, whether you know their names or not. It is in all of us. It is in every single cell of all of our being. And as we know this truth, as we just sit and contemplate this truth, it sets us free from all kind of misunderstandings. And because our thinking change, our behavior changes, our behavior changes, and we create a world that works for everyone because we're all awake to an infinite truth and okay with it expressing through us however it does. I celebrate that this is how spirit works, that this is what spirit is. 
Grace itself is now at work, has been at work, and is moving us forward into a brighter light where there are no shadows. Having witnessed this truth, having absolutely come into contact with the one mind and recognized myself and all of us as part of it, I gratefully release this word to the law of cause and effect which has already started making itself. Bless it all, I call it good, and so it is.